All right, and we should be live. Okay, and let me just test it out just to make sure that we're good. They can definitely hear us, though. So for those of you who are watching, hi, this is John with Long Island Tabletop and Legendary Realms Games. And you are watching our digital painting and drawing tutorial with our special guest, David Miller. Uh, David, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, by the way. It's a kind of a cold, rainy day today, so good day to stay in and... Uh, I uh, was well, not supposed to get out anyway, social distancing as it is, but uh, and do a little drawing today. Uh, so, John, do you have anything else you want to add? Well, why don't you give us some of your background, you know, let us know your history with, you know, art and things in general, and also your experience with gaming, and then we can kind All of right. get into what you're going to be doing today. All right, well, I'll just take over from there. Yeah. So, hi, everybody. My name's David Miller. Uh, you'll notice on screen right now it's David O. Miller, my middle initial. There's just so many David Millers in the world that if you try to find me online, look up David Miller, you won't. So, I've always uh, gone by David O. Miller. It's not O. Miller apostrophe. It's not an Irish German name <laughs> like a lot of people thought, uh, but davidomiller.com. So, I'm actually working in Photoshop, and I'm going to be doing a lot of digital illustration today. Just show you some, some simple tips, some simple things. I know a lot of you may be beginners in this, and a lot of you may be a little, have a little more experience, uh, and that's the wrong thing. And here we go. So, uh, on screen right now, I have examples of some of the work I've done over the years. Uh, back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, uh, I started working for TSR and a variety of different gaming companies. Uh, this was revised second edition player's handbook, Emmer called the Chaotic. Uh, some of these, this is a rust spell. Uh, some of these were high level campaigns. Uh, some of you may recognize some of these, maybe not. Uh, a little bit later in my career, I did a lot in Spelljammer. Uh, I did a lot for Dark Sun as well. Uh, just a lot of interior work, some cover work. So you can probably, maybe you might recognize some of these as I scroll down through them. Uh, this was a dragon, I'm sorry, a dungeon magazine cover. Uh, and then here is another dungeon magazine cover. I don't know the issue numbers on these, but uh, they were probably 92, 93, uh, back when I was going to Gen Con a lot at the time. Uh, well, here, in fact, you can see it right here. Look at that. It was issue 67 from uh, 1998. In fact, it was a little bit later than I thought it was. Uh, I, almost everything you see at the beginning of that is acrylic painting. I switched over to digital. Uh, I don't know, probably, see, Max came out in 84. Photoshop was around 87. I probably switched digital about mid-90s, started dabbling in it. Uh, this is digital work now. I'm almost 100% digital in everything I do, uh, though I still draw by hand and I still scan it in and then I uh, take it from there. And all my finishing is done in Photoshop. Uh, Challenge Magazine I worked for down here. Uh, I did a lot with GDW. Uh, here's a Spelljammer piece that some of you may or may not know, Ostermundi Cluster. Uh, tremendous amount of work I did in Spelljammer. Uh, in fact, you can see some of the Spelljammer pieces here. Lots of black and whites. Um, I sort of got out of the business mid, uh, probably late 90s or so. It was economic reasons more than anything else. So that's a little bit about myself. I'm gonna close all this back up. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk about how I go about creating a digital painting. Uh, what are the steps involved? And I'm gonna do a quick painting. Uh, I know John says he's gonna watch the chat line for me. So if any of you out there listening have any questions, you can uh, chat in to John and he'll break in every now and then and uh, relay those over to me. So, of course, the first thing you do when you any kind of painting uh, is the concept. A concept is the single most important thing, honestly. Uh, if you've got a good idea, if you've got a good concept going, uh, that's really half the battle. In a lot of cases, as a professional illustrator, uh, I don't come up with the concept. I'm usually illustrating the written word. Uh, the writer has worked with the art director. They've worked with an editor. And they present the concept to me for such and such uh, article or a game cover or a box cover. Uh, and then I have to take that concept and give them a variety of sketches. Uh, so I'm an illustrator. I do do fine art, but my bread and butter is turning out uh, illustrations for the written word usually. So now it's no secret that a lot of people as illustrators use photography. And uh, I'll start talking in that 
let's say we're going to draw something like a wizard or an ogre or something uh, for a filler piece for a game module. So in this particular case, if it's a wizard or so, I would go about thinking about what his pose is, what the types of clothing he would be wearing, and then uh, I would stage my photography. So now I'll give you some example of photography that's being used by a lot of artists or illustrators over the years. We'll look at Norman Rockwell's work. Uh, Norman went to great lengths to have his wife create costumes, sew the costumes. He would go to old Army Navy stores. He would do a lot of things where he would stage the piece and then make uh, the painting from the photography. So a lot of people say, well, is that cheating? I go, no, it's not really cheating in my book because I'm an illustrator and I'm usually having to work on fairly tight deadlines. And besides, if Norman Rockwell can do it, so can I. If it's good for Norm, it's good for me, is the way I like to look at it. So uh, in this particular case, I've got a wizard photo here uh, of myself. Uh, that's my graduation gown from high school. It's an old uh, cloak. Uh, I think it's a flagpole I'm using as a staff. And I don't take photography like this so that I will lavishly copy the photography. The photography helps me to uh, things with folds and clothing and proportion. It's a good place to springboard from. So if you uh, are an illustrator, really, I guess what I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with using photography to get you started. So based on that image, you can see where I've gone ahead and completely changed the face. I've tweaked things. I had a pair of just straight boots on. You just start adding things to this illustration and changing the staff, embellishing the, the articles of the clothing. So I don't know if any of you out there have had a lot of experience in Photoshop, but basically what I'm doing is I'm bringing that photograph in. And again, I don't like the word tracing, but I like to use you know this embellishing on top of the photo. Where the photo doesn't work, you alter it. Uh, to do this, you really have to have the ability to draw. Uh, if you don't have the ability to draw, then you know it's kind of like garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. So if any of you out there watching or listening when it comes to doing artwork or illustration work, you really have to work on the fundamentals of drawing. Uh, you should be able to draw the figure fairly well. You should be able to uh, figure invent if you can. Again, I'm just using this photography as a time-saving uh, 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 device. All right, so with that in mind, I'll turn all these off. I'll start with the line art. Uh, and then, because again, I'm in Photoshop, I can start adding layers on top of that. Something like the, the wood grain I'll put in because I can clip it to that area. And then I'll put in this design. Another thing about working in layers is if I put this design in and I don't like it, I can take it out later on. So if it's on its own layer, plus I can also dial it back. If I come in close to this drawing, you can see I can lower the opacity on that sort of floral design or raise it. This idea of working in a variety of layers is really helpful. If any of you have ever done acrylic painting, you understand layers. If you start with a piece of canvas and paint the sky first and then like tree second and then the, the subject matter in front of that, you're already starting to understand how layers work. You wouldn't paint the trees first and then try to paint the blue sky in between all the leaves and limbs and things. That would not work. So this idea that you're working in layers in Photoshop. So there's a stacking order. This layer is above this layer. I'll move the layers palette over. This is above this, this is above this, and all the way down. So that you see the white background is at the bottom, and then this color comes on top. On top of that color is the art. On top of that is the wood grain, and on top of that is the lace work. Uh, so that's really fundamental about working in Photoshop is this ability to work on different layers. For that case, I could come in under the color layer if I wanted to change the color of this layer. I'm not changing anything but the color that's on that layer. Like if my wizard is predominantly here in purple robes or blue robes, I can go ahead and dial that in. I can oversaturate or undersaturate the color, making it brighter. And I can make it lighter or I can make it darker, depending on where do I think I should start uh, from an art point of view. So if I dial this in, I may stick with this little guy and work with him. Uh, uh, the next thing I would do, and by the way, you know, Photoshop is one of those things. I've been working in it since 1987 when it first came out. I'm fairly uh, completely self-taught uh, and I'm still learning in this program. 
uh, even the people that write the application say that they would know about 40% of what it can do. So you're in good company if you're just starting out in Photoshop. Uh, it's a tremendously deep application, very complicated. Uh, you can learn it on your own to a point, but then there's so many ways that you can work more efficiently so that if you, you find uh, tutorials online or listen to tutorials like I'm doing, you may pick up some different pointers. Uh, I'm going to keep this kind of base level, though uh, I'll throw out a few pointers for some of the more advanced users. So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down my command key. Now I have a shift key, an option, alt key, and a command key because I'm working on a Mac. And if I command click on a layer, uh, I'll select. And if you can see now, there's marching ants going around the figure. So what does that mean exactly? Well, I can take a paintbrush with brown paint. And I'll go ahead and I can draw anywhere on this layer right now. But if I go ahead and make a selection, it'll only let me draw inside of that selection. So in a way, a, a selection is the beginnings of making a mask in this. It's a way to mask off parts of the drawing so that I'm only working on the parts I want. It's almost like I'm taking masking tape and I'm taping all this area off so that when I draw, it only goes in there instead of all over the place. Does that make sense, hopefully, to everybody? So I'm going to create that again. I'm going to go ahead and option click on my color layer and that pulls that up. Now, how did I create that layer? It was pretty simple. I went to my drawing. I used something called the magic wand and I clicked out here on the outside and you see how it goes. When you use magic wand, you click on a color, in this case white, and it goes looking for anything that's white. And when it hits something that isn't white, like these black lines, it stops. And that's called, and I'm going to click in that little area. I'll create a new layer. Now, when you create a new layer, what's on that layer? Well, there's nothing on that layer. And then I'm going to fill it with a color. In this case, I picked a blue color and I just fill it like that. Now, I filled the background. What I need to do is fill the guy. So what did I select? I selected the white outside. So under select, I can go to inverse. Now, when I go to inverse, it deselects the areas that are selected and selects the areas that weren't. It flips it. So now they flip. And now when I do that, I get the, uh, the, the uh, blue inside. Now, if I put that below the drawing and I can throw this color away, you can see there it is. I've got a dark blue. From there, I can go ahead and adjust the saturation. Let's turn that down because it's really dark and maybe lighten it a little bit so you can see the drawing and say OK to that. So this idea that I can start throwing color down and I can control where it goes is a big plus. Also, another thing when I start a digital piece like this is I want to set up my color palette. I'm going to show you another piece really quickly, uh, painting examples here, and I'll come and open this up. There was another gaming convention up in uh, the Boston area that I've been a guest at every year for the past several years. And I did their, uh, it's called Total Convention or Total Con. And usually when I do a piece like this, I'll come in really close so you can see all the textures, is I'll create uh, a color palette of all the skin colors that I'm going to be using. And it's just easier for me to create that first and then start to uh, apply them onto my drawing. So because I only have an hour here, I've gone ahead and created a quick color palette for this drawing. Let me zoom back down on this guy a little bit. And let's see how far we can get on him as we move forward. So the color palette. So now this is just another little file that I created and I've gone ahead and I've just scribbled down from a light to a dark and this are his skin tones. This may or may not be his robe colors. I can still play around with that. And just like I showed you a second ago, I can adjust these colors. I can go under image and I can go to adjustments and I can go to uh, uh, hue saturation. And by changing the hue, you can see how the colors are all changing. They're going through like a rainbow, if you will, colors. And so if I decide if he wanted to be like an ogre or an orc, I could start with green colors. In this particular case, I'll stay with these more human flesh tones. All right, so now with that in mind, I can actually bring this in. Uh, now I'm using the move tool to drag and drop it in, say okay to that. And that brings my colors in uh, on a pal on its own layer. So here's my, uh, here's my palette. I could rename this palette and see if I can spell. I'm an artist, not a speller, but I think that's how you spell palette. And move it up to the top. And I could pl position this anywhere that I want on screen. I can even make it smaller if I want. It doesn't need to be that big. 
and keep it just handy. So since it's on its own layer, it's moving around. So now let's just get into this actual painting. Once I've got this sort of set up and I'm ready to start, uh, I'm gonna start adding color. So one of the things about working in Photoshop again, and I repeat this to a lot of students, is layers, 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 layers. You always wanna have new layers whenever you start something else on the painting. So down across the bottom of my layers palette down here, I have things like trash cans that throw layers away. And I have all sorts of symbols, but I have this little symbol of the plus. So I'm gonna click on that and that creates a new layer. It's called layer two, it's just the layer order. And there's nothing on this, it's completely clear. It's like a piece of glass, if you will. So I'm gonna go ahead and just name it color or, or I could call it skin tones if I wanted, I could call it color. I'm gonna go ahead and option click here so I can get my marching ants. And I'm gonna turn all this off. Now, when I hit all these eyeballs, it's almost like closing your eyes to these layers. It hides them. It doesn't throw them away. It just hides them. By clicking and dragging back up through, I show it. So it's like hide and seek with the layers, if you will. So if I hide all of that, all right, and I say I had a paintbrush here, you can see that it's only gonna paint inside. It's only gonna paint inside of that selection. So I just want you to see where I was with that. I'll turn all those back on. And now let's talk about the paintbrush tool. This is the paintbrush, and if I click up here, I get all my brushes that I'm currently uh, have loaded on my uh, machine. Now, Photoshop comes with a, a lot of brushes, and if you, uh, it's a subscription service now, and if you subscribe to it, you can also download hundreds more brushes or thousands of brushes through Kyle's brushes. Uh, your basic brushes, however, your hard round and your soft round brushes through here. Uh, this hard round brush, you can see that it goes, it's thick all the way through, and this brush just goes thick to thin. This is a pressure sensitive brush. Now, I don't have a way to show you this just yet, but I am working on a Wacom drawing tablet. I have an Intuos 5 and it supports pressure sensitivity. So with that said, I'll show you, this is a non-pressure sensitive brush. It's just drawing what's called a dead line. But if I come back up and I click and I get a thick to thin brush, now I can go thin to thick to thin and I get a pressure sensitive, which is a lot more intuitive. Now you can't do this with a mouse. If you're using a mouse, it's like you're drawing with a bar of soap. Uh, you, you just, can you imagine going to a drawing class with a bar, of, bring a bar of soap and a pen and stick the pen in the bar of soap and draw with it. So if you're stuck at home and you're still struggling with being a Photoshop artist and you really want to take your uh, career to the next level, you, you really have to invest in some sort of drawing tablet that gives you pressure sensitivity. And I can tell you, you know, not to sell you on these, but you get what you pay for in a computer world. It, it, it absolutely. My tablet's probably 350. I don't know what the going rate for them is right now. So with this brush again, I've got so many brushes. One of my things I like to do is straggle, is go ahead and drag this all the way across so that I minimize my need to scroll through this that much. So I got a lot of splatter brushes. I've got a lot of natural media brushes here. Um, the brushes are endless. And one of the cool things about Photoshop is you can make your own brushes too. I've got uh, friends who work for Marvel and DC uh, as colorists and they almost always use their own brushes that they've made. I'm gonna stick with this hard round right now just to show you that you don't really need a lot of fancy brushes to do a painting in. So this is what I'm getting. Now, this is like acrylic paint in a way or watercolor. When you use watercolor or acrylics, you thin it with water. And when you thin it down, you create what's called a wash. So you see my opacity up here set to 100%. Now I could go up and I could click on little buttons like this and I can move them around or I could click on the word opacity and drag them around. But to work fast, all you have to do is hit the number keys across the top of your keyboard. So if I hit the number three, I go to 33%. I hit enter like that. Number two takes me to 20%. Five will take me to 50%. So this is 100% of the blue. And then this is 30% of the blue. You see how it creates like a, a colored wash, if you will. So rather than just working with solid colors, I'm going to build up color in washes so that I can see through them. I'm also going to put my color underneath my sketch. So now when I draw, let me put this back to 100%, you can still see the drawing. In normal painting, of course, I would do a drawing and then throw paint on top of it. It would cover my drawing. Well, here I have the ability to put my drawing and paint underneath it. 
And for those of you who've had any kind of Photoshop experience, it's because I've got this layer set to multiply. This is my art layer. It's set to multiply. I know that may be a little more advanced for some of you, but just giving you a quick overview again. So now I don't want to leave my paintbrush tool to work. So there are a series of very, very important shortcuts that you can use to keep yourself from doing that. For example, you could come over and, and when I first learned, if I wanted to zoom, I'd have to go one and then two, and then three, and then four to click on the hand tool, and then five to move it, and then six to click on the brush and then draw something. And so I did six clicks and did one thing. So one of the first things you learn is how to stay on the brush tool by holding down the space bar gives you the hand tool and you let go of the space bar so you don't have to go over and click on it, space bar. And the other thing is you use command plus or control on a PC and minus to zoom in and out, space bar to move it and you don't leave the hand tool again, I mean the brush tool again. So some of these little shortcuts are really time saving. I want to keep, when I teach this, whether it's in a class or of course now with COVID more and more private lessons, we need to go over those shortcuts and you need to learn them very easily to stick with this. Another important shortcut while you're on the brush is the option Alt key. And if you can see that, it turns it into an eyedropper tool. Again, I do not want to leave the brush while I'm working. So I'm gonna click on this tone and come over, set it to 100% and I'll go ahead and I could fill it in like that. Uh, so I'll sit in my base tones really fast. I can be sloppy with this. This is just his skin tones. Uh, another thing that you need to know is how to control the size of the brush. Again, you could come up here and you could click on the brush and you could use these little sliders to make it hot and you're just wasting your time. So on my keyboard next to the letter P are the two bracket keys. My rat, right bracket key is going to make this brush bigger, you see, like that. And my left bracket key is going to make it smaller. So. I come out of a painting background, and one of the things I learned in painting a long time ago is you start with large brushes and you work your way to smaller brushes. So you don't start with small brushes. Uh, can you imagine if I had a really small brush, let me come in close to this hand like this, and I wanted to fill this in, and I'd be sitting there doing this all day because I'm working with this tiny brush. So this idea of using the brackets to make it really big, and let's just blob it in there really fast. We clean all that stuff up later. All right, so back up. I'll concentrate on doing his face. So I'm doing Command Plus and Command Minus. I'm holding down the space bar. I'm moving this around, and I haven't left the brush. I'm still in the brush the whole time. And now I'm going ahead and move to the move to. I'm going to move this that wrong thing. I want to move the palette over slightly so that I can see it better, and then back to my color. So now let's start painting. Uh, let's work to the highlights. So I'm going to make my brush smaller, and I'm going to start putting in the height. Oh, didn't like me. Here we go. It's because of Zoom, probably. It's trying to keep up. So I could put that in like this, or I could put it at 50%. So I'll start putting in highlights into the color and move it. So I don't know if you can see how fast I'm working here. I just want to figure out where the highlights are on this guy. So this is these cheekbones. I'm constantly making my brush bigger or smaller and putting it where I think the highlights are going to be. This neck musculature here, across the top of the nose. Let's see. I'm going to undo a few times here because I lost my marching ants. Going too fast here. I like this. All right. So now let me move over. I'm going to go ahead and get my next tone, which is a darker tone, and I'll start to place that in. I'm going to go ahead and set that to 2% opacity. I hit the number 2, and I'll just start painting. So away we go. So uh, and then you can just put on some soft music, have a nice cup of coffee, and we'll start to place all this in. He's looking kind of undead there for a second, isn't he? And away we go like this. You find where your shadows are. Now, a lot of people think you draw and then you paint. And I like to say, well, you never stop drawing. When you draw, you draw with a pencil or an ink pen. But here I'm drawing with paint. I'm still drawing uh, in a sense. Uh, there are some paintings I'll just start where I won't even have a sketch uh, and won't be slave to that sketch. I'll just draw it in. Uh, let me get back to my color palette like this. And uh, I'll just start drawing shapes and start playing from there. You can always paint over. 
a lot of people get really scared when they paint and they draw. And I like to say, well, you look, there's no mistakes here because you have the undo key constantly. Uh, let me go back to this part and pick up this color again. See, I can paint back over that to thin it, thin it down or just sort of, I'm doing like a wash of color over top of it. So now as I move up further into my highlights, uh, these highlights can get a little more light. So I'm going to switch over to the color picker. Double click on the color picker brings up the place where you pick colors. Uh, it's, I, I like to joke, it's not a southern rock band. It's not the color pickers. It's the place you pick colors. So when you use the color picker, a lot of people just say, oh, that's easy. I'll take it and I'll go from there. But nothing's really that easy in Photoshop. Color is so important when you do uh, digital work. Uh, right now, it's showing me an area in this box of color. Let's talk about that for a second. As I move into the upper left up here, now I'm clicking and dragging the box. I have white. And as I move across, you can see here I'm adding a color. All right? And as I go down, I add black. If I get up here to the upper left or right hand corner, you can see an exclamation point up here. That says I'm about to pick a color that's too bright and I can't print it. So for example, if I get into like these lime greens, you see that color? There's no way I'm gonna be able to print that with ink on white paper. That ink is, I mean, my, the ink is only as bright as the paper. And the, I mean, the ink is only as bright as uh, say in that particular case, yellow and blue there's yellow ink and there's blue ink. I can't make them any brighter than they are and it's on white paper. The reason you're seeing this so vibrant or radioactive is because you're viewing it on a computer monitor, which is basically a backlit light box. So if I click on this exclamation point, it actually hops down to the closest printable color. And I'm into this area where I actually can print these colors. There's no way I'm gonna be able to print that. Uh, if I come back up into uh, these colors, and move across the lime greens and the lime purples, the really bright purples, I mean, are the worst offenders. You can't print those colors. Now, if I was teaching a real acrylic painting class, one of the first things I would say to my students is don't bring a tube of black paint into my classroom. Because if you just uh, go straight down and add black constantly to your colors to shade them, uh, you're going to get a really dull looking painting. So let me cancel out of this and show you what I would do. I would double click this. I can move this up, and this is the color I had, and this is the color I'm about to pick. You can see the top color here is the color I'm about to pick. That way I could compare them. By moving it up into the warms or into the uh, yellows and then moving up this way, I'm creating a color rather than just adding white to it. Because if I come over this way, I'm gonna wash the color out too much. And now by making the brush smaller, I can start to add in highlights. I'll make it a little larger. Like I said before, you start with bright or large brushes, and then you work your way to the smaller ones. You pick out the planes of the face. Around we go like this. And then I'll start making this brush smaller, and I'll start putting in more detail. Now, I've only put down about four colors, maybe five, but I have hundreds, if not thousands, of colors on there because of the way these are all interacting. The further you get into digital painting and if you get into your career as an artist, you start learning a lot about drawing. One of the things you'll pick up is the blues on the face. Uh, and I'll get into sort of the dark blues and I'll put this at a 2%. The reason I'm putting like a blue wash on here, especially on men because of their beards, they tend to uh, have a bluish tinge to their face, especially people with blacker hair. Uh, so you'll see a lot of fine artists that will put in shading like that. Plus, you want your warm colors to be your highlights. And I could come back in, not to give him blue eyeshadow here, but I could just put in little hints of blue under the nose in places where I know there'd be a shadow color. And that starts to cool down the shadows. So if you're out there thinking about art as a career, there's a lot to learn still. Uh, basic drawing, color theory, uh, figure drawing, uh, understanding shapes and solids, all that stuff is extremely important. So now I'm going to turn every layer off, and that's really all I've been painting. I've been painting that on top of this layer, right? And I accidentally painted on the wrong layer here when I did it, but that's okay, right? So now that's an acrylic painting kind of view. I'm going to go ahead and throw in some darker colors here. I'll just pick a red really fast and adjust it make like a bluish black and let's put his beard in. I'm gonna set my brush to 
and I'll work with large colored brushes first, that may be too blue. Uh, let's just darken it down a little bit like this. Uh, a lot of artists will work with black. They'll put black down first, and then they'll build up from there. So I'm going to throw in his beard like this. Uh, and, and there's no right or wrong way to do this. Uh, I don't know if you knew the Hildebrandt brothers, but I had the good fortune at Comic Con, just New York Comic Con, just this past year, to have a, a wonderful, like, 40 minute conversation with Greg Hildebrandt. And come to find out, because I've always admired the Hildebrandt brothers' work, um, and uh, I found out that Greg actually starts his paintings black and then paints on top of them. So I'm going to throw this in really fast. So you see how I'm using large brushes to block it in. And now I'll get a really large brush and finish this out. Now, I don't usually paint with black. And I'm making a mistake here because black on black, you can't see anything. It's a silhouette. So uh, I made a little bit of a mistake there, but that's OK. And then I'll take smaller brushes. And since this is a pressure sensitive tablet, I'll go ahead and start working towards the details. You always work towards the details here. So I can fix this black in a few minutes. And so away we go. So again, because of time restraints, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to deselect this so I can bring some strands of hair out like this. And then you can see how I can start to add shadows into that. Now, again, Photoshop, tremendously cool program. I can go ahead and take my magic wand and select all of that black. So you see, if I click here, I'll select an area of light color. If I click there, then I'm selecting the black. And what I think I'll do is I think I'll dial that down. I've got it too black, and I can't see my sketch underneath it. So by just selecting it, picking a, a blue and filling it, and now I can continue to work with that color instead. And that way I can see my sketch underneath it. So even if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. You can usually nine times out of 10 fix it. So again, I would spend a little more time than I'm doing right now, just getting this all blocked in. And then I'll come along and I don't have a color palette here. So let's just start coming up into some different colors and I'll start adding in highlights. Now I can hit the number four and start putting in highlights to the hair. And you got to figure out where your light source is. I'm going to lock this down uh, like this. And uh, so you can see the marching ants so that it doesn't go flying off of there. So every time I go over this, I build up the color a little bit more. And I'm getting on his face a little bit there. And I can introduce some different colors. I can introduce some browns now into here. I don't like that. So I have the undo key. So I can build up browns a lot differently. It's Bluebeard, the wizard, I don't know. That's his character's name. And away we go, like that. So I'm at the halfway point, John. I'll assume there's no questions or anything online. So. Uh, there's a couple of comments in the thread. No specific questions. Um, you have a shout out from a Rob uh, Riley. R -A Rob Riley, I yeah. Um, Hi, Rob. Very talented teacher uh, in high school and uh, he does an, ama does an amazing program. I'm glad you're watching. We also have a couple of comments from Thread Raiders. Uh, a couple of people, one post says, I recently got into Photoshop. It seems a little overwhelming at first, but once you get used to it, it's very helpful. Um, they like the idea of having a color palette, and they were a little thrown off about starting in black, uh, saying it's a, like a, a bit of an unusual approach. Yeah, the, the, I made a mistake when I was doing the hair which I corrected, but uh, in talking to Mr. Hildebrandt, uh, he gets very vibrant colors. He's painting in acrylics, and I was really surprised that he started with black and then built out. Um, usually you start with a middle tone color, and then you, you add your highlights. You work into your highlights, and you work down into your shadows. Uh, a, a, a teacher friend of mine said, you start with the bridge, and then you paint over the bridge and under the bridge. Uh, this whole idea of middle tone into highlights, into shadows. Uh, so that's generally what I tend to do as well, is start with the middle flat color, which I did on the face, and work from there. Uh, so moving forward, now I have all these colors established in a watercolor or acrylic sort of uh, point of view. I'm going to switch over into an oil uh, technique. To show you an oil technique, I'm going to hide all these colors except these pieces. And I'm going to switch to the smudge tool. The smudge tool is the blur, the sharpen, and the smudge. And what the smudge tool does is if you, it, well, it smears things, right? So if I use a smudge tool on this, you see how it's smudging the colors together? 
Now, there is a color mixer tool as well, which is a little more complicated than I have time to explain, but it's good if you're just starting in Photoshop to start thinking oil paint, you're gonna use the smudge tool. So the smudge tool can use a lot of variety of brushes. You can smudge with pretty much any brush. Just like I can erase with all these brushes, I can draw with all these brushes, I can smudge with them, I can clone with them. Uh, you gotta be a little careful when you get into the newer brushes. If it has a little symbol next to it, these are Kyle's brushes, that is a brush. It can't, I can't use it as an eraser and I can't use it as a smudge tool. So you gotta be a little careful of that. Let's see if I can find one in here as I go down through these. Some of these are, are different. That little finger there, that's a smudge tool. This little raindrop is a mixer brush tool and, and these are paint brushes. So they're very specific tools that do a very specific thing. If it doesn't have that little symbol next to it, then you can do anything with it. You can smudge with it, you can draw with it, you can erase with it, and so on and so forth. A tools, some of my favorite brushes, by the way, are there's one called drippy water. I know these are really technical <laughs> terms, but drippy water is a lot of fun to draw with. But when I like to uh, smudge, I like to use this rough, dry brush. Now, this brush is found in your, uh, just your normal brushes. I got in their special effects brushes here because I moved my brushes around a little bit. Uh, but it's a legacy brush. And when I double click on it, you can see all the spots. Uh, it represents an old brush that paint has dried in and the bristles have all like sprung out. So now, and I can use the bracket tool to make this bigger or smaller. And when I drag with this brush, you see how it drags like I'm dragging a paint brush. So by coming in a little close to this, what I can do is I can set the strength of this. If I hit the number one on my keyboard, you see just like I hit the number one on my paintbrush to control the flow of the paint, you see this is barely smudging. If I hit the number six, it smudges a little bit more. If I hit the number zero, it's a complete smudge and you really can't use the smudge brush on 100% of a strength. I like the number eight quite a bit and it allows me to, to blend. So if we were painting in oil paints, first of all, it would smell like crazy here in my studio because you're working in oil paints. What you tend to do though, is you put down two colors and you drag one color into one and one color into the other, and then you blend between the two. And what this creates is a transitional zone between this color and this color. The greater you do that, the bigger the transitional zone between the two of them. So try to tell me that that doesn't look like paint. I mean, it just smears. And the fact that I took painting and I came out of a painting background, I think has really helped me in a lot of ways with Photoshop. Uh, this ability to control paint and understand contours, uh, I'll, which I'll speak to in just a second. All right, so I'm gonna zoom this back down. I'll move him over here like this. I'm not really too keen on my color choices right now, but you know, I could change these. I could come under this layer. I could go under hue saturation and I could just start to change. Uh, I could isolate parts of an area and say, what that, it looks more zombie that way. So even though you put color down, doesn't mean you have to live with it. You can constantly adjust it. So now I'm gonna go to the top and I'm gonna create a new layer. Again, layer two, what's on this layer? There's nothing on this layer. So if I try to use the smudge tool, let me turn something off. If I try to use the smudge tool right now, nothing's gonna happen because I'm not smudging on anything. There's nothing there to smudge. If I go down to the color layer, and that's the color layer, now when I do this, I can smear what's on that layer, but only what's on that layer. So I'm gonna turn this, I'm gonna undo that and turn everything back on again. So one of the beauties of working with the smudge tool is you've got this thing called sample all layers. So if I click on sample all layers, and now when I smudge, I'll do it across this way, I am taking everything on every layer and smudging it on this layer. Hey, let me just go across this really quick like that. Now, I'm gonna turn all the layers off but that layer. I literally smudged everything onto its own layer. I didn't smudge anywhere down here. All that is still fine. It's only working on this layer. So the beauty of that is, is that now, if I make a mistake after working on it for two or three hours and I don't like it, I can stop, throw the layer away and keep going. So now I'm smudging. If it's visible, it will smear. So if I don't wanna have the line art smearing, I'll turn it off and I'll come in close. It all depends on what you want. If you can see it, it will smudge. 
because again, sample all layers is on. So with that in mind, I can come along and I can start more of a painting. And I'm pretending that all these colors are wet and now I'm starting to intermingle them. Again, if you, if you, some of you are interested in Photoshop, once you get a technique like this down, then you can use the mixer brush tool to do similar effects. So now I can switch back and forth. Now I'm gonna make my brush really small and start to smear. I'm keeping my left hand on the keyboard. I'm using my bracket tools to make it bigger or smaller, depending on where I need it. I've got it set to 80%, which is a, a comfortable uh, strength for me to work in. And I'm not trying to completely hide the details, but I'm starting to bring them up and out. And now I'm gonna to switch to brush. I'm gonna get a gray color I'm going to set my opacity to number three, and I'm going to come in and I'm going to put in the whites of the eye here a little bit. And then maybe I'll flip to pure white and put in a little bit here. I'll come in close to that. I'll go back to my smudge tool, make my brush really small, and I'll smudge that all together. And it literally, John and everyone listening, uh, is very much like working with paint uh, without the, the smell and the, uh, uh, the mess of it all. So now B takes me to brush. Option Alt gives me an eyedropper tool. I put it to something like 70% and I start putting in some little highlights like that. Maybe there's a highlight across the top of his lid. Uh, I'll flip this to white and I'll put my brush to 100% and I'll put in solid white on the eye. Uh, maybe I'll pick up a little bit of color like a blue and I'll come in and I'll throw, I'll put this down to 4% and I'll put a little bit of a blue in there. I'll go back to my smudge tool and I'll go ahead and, and pretend that it's wet paint again and I'll smudge it all together a little bit more. So you see how small my brush is now? I'm working up. I start with big brushes at first to smear large areas like this. And then because my hand is on that keyboard, I can keep making that brush bigger or smaller depending on what it is I wanna do. And so this allows you to just to get going and work and smear and do whatever. And of course you can paint over, but I'm all I'm doing all of that on layer two. Uh, and the rest of the painting is, uh, the areas that I'm not smudging is showing through. And I don't need to smudge every bit of this painting. If there's something I don't like, I can pick up a color. I'm on the brush again, set to 100% and I'll start adding some browns in here. And I'll set this down to 1% and I'll just build it up in washes and sort of build this up maybe to 2%, come in like that. And I'm over painting, go back to my smudge tool. By the way, they used to have a shortcut to get to the smudge tool and they took it away. And, you know, Adobe does questionable things sometimes, uh, but you know, what it is, you gotta roll with the punches. Uh, older versions of software works differently now than the, the newer versions. So that gives you some idea of how to go about. Now, I would just spend a lot of time doing this. Uh, let me show you the hair. Smudge tool works just great on hair. Do you see this kind of feeling you get? Let me see if I can just take this out like this. Eh, it's getting a little weird there, but around we go. And I can smear in smaller brushes. Uh, I use the smudge tool a lot for hair. And then once I've done that, I'll come back and I'll uh, go ahead and draw hair back in and bring in some highlights. Let's go ahead and click here. And uh, now I started out a little slow and now I'm starting to build up speed, which is what you want to do as a digital artist. You want to be able to work fast and you want to be able to work the whole painting as you go. Uh, so let's see how I'm doing on time. Well, I got about 20 minutes tops. So that's digital painting. I'm gonna switch in just a second and talk about cartooning a little bit, uh, just so I don't sit here and just spend all the time on this. You know, the devil's in the details. The more details you put in here, the better off this is gonna get and become, and then switching back and forth between your variety of tools. I went to the hand tool rather than the sponge tool and smearing these things back in, sort of blends them together and gets rid of the brush strokes like that. All right. so. I don't know if anybody had any questions online, John, but that's mm. the gist of that. Yeah, no, no questions in the chat just yet, but you know, we'll, uh, if anything does pop up, I'll make sure to let you know. I'm just, I'm just enthralling everybody, aren't I? That's what yeah, it no, is. Like I said, I got a handful of people <laughs> checking it out, so. That's awesome. There we go. But that smudge tool, uh, if you really are just starting out, is wonderful like that. 
All right, so let me move this off to the side. I'll show you a finished painting again. Let's open this guy back up and uh, I'll come in close to this. So now you can see, I want you to see uh, all the, well, this guy looks crazy uh, in close, doesn't he? So now you can see the smudge tool here. I'm just gonna smear across the top. I'm following contours. You see, this is a round shape. So the contour, it has to go around the shape around the end of the nose. If I drew this straight across like that, it would make the, the nose look flat. So when I said earlier about understanding contours and so on and so forth, uh, it helps contours falling along the edge. When we get over to, to her with the hair, uh, you can see, again, dark browns, shafts of light browns, a little bit of purplish color. I'm throwing purple around through the whole painting, some of this background red, and then I'm smearing it. And I'm not smearing it just straight like this. Uh, I'm giving it, because she has curly hair, there's a good example of, of following contours around. If I get in really close to the texture here, you see I'm trying to work it very finessely. A lot of, is that even a word? I'm working with a lot of finesse to try to get, and here you see that greenish tinge, even though she doesn't have beard cover, of course she does not have beard, but these cooler shadow areas and under the nose here and around the eyes. You have a lot more blood vessels and capillaries closer to eyes, so you can take on a little bit of a purple look in here, uh, a little bit of a green look in here, blues for guys. And, uh, you can see just tremendous amount of smudging. I, I love the technique. And you don't have to smudge in lines. You can just smudge like boom, boom and, and shapes just to get texture. Otherwise, that's just a flat blade. You need to have textures on things. Lighting is important. I can go back into a paintbrush, pick this blue back up, set it to number three, and we could go ahead and paint in like this. Now I'm using a hard edge brush. You could also use a soft edge brush like this to get a, a, a bit of a, of a glow in here like that. So if I wanted to highlight the blues a little more on him and in here, and then I could come back in and I could smear that together. So I'll undo all that really fast. Let's see if we can undo it. Let's see, go back like this. Da, 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 da. It helps make little noises when you use Photoshop. Bring that back down. So there's an example of, of a painting uh, taken all the way to its finish using the same techniques that I was showing you here uh, in blending, even though uh, that one's not looking as good as I'd like. <laughs> All right, uh, from here. So when we get into um, more of a cartoon feel, I'm gonna open up a piece that, uh, I don't know if you know, if any of you out there knew Bernie Wrightson as an artist, he worked on Swamp Thing, uh, did a Frankenstein, but Bernie was an amazing uh, illustrator and uh, his pen and ink uh, are, uh, or par not, or absolutely. So when he passed away a couple years ago, I did this real quick digital piece. It was kind of a, it was, I was just a huge follower of Bernie's work. Uh, it, it sort of looks like he's Swamp Thing kind of monster. Uh, but this is more of a line art uh, kind of piece. And you can see all my, my layers here. I think it's good for a student in Photoshop to start seeing you know, layers, 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 how important it is. In this particular case, this was drawn 100% digital. And I just started with a, uh, a, a blank piece of paper set to white. I create a new layer. And in this case, I just go to a paintbrush. You could use a pencil, but I think in this case, I used a hard round with pressure sensitivity. And rather than drawing with black, I drew with like a light gray. Uh, and then I just started drawing just like this. And you know, you sketch and whatever it is you're trying to do. Beauty of this is if you don't like it, you've got the undo key to go back 30, 40 steps. So you sketch it in and then you go over top of that and you start to draw, all right? So uh, I could get into a lot more complicated about how I achieve that uh, beyond the scope of probably this quick demo. Uh, but the idea is to lose the sketch eventually. And now I'm up on this layer, I'm in solid black at 100%. And here I'm drawing like this. And you know, I'm putting in fine lines and, and, and so on. Uh, layers, uh, let's see, I created a stick like here. Here's the stick. And I put some of the texture there. I put some more wood grain texture there, which I mechanically drew. On top of that is some more parts of the stick. And then I put some whites on here. So what's on that layer is blacks and whites. It's extra detail that just sort of add it all together, pull it back in. 
and there's my signature on a layer. So I'm going to start working on this as a in the last uh, 10 minutes or so that we have uh, as a just a cartoony kind of piece. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to collect everything into its own layer. In the layers palette, uh, I have uh, all sorts of ways that I can delete layers and copy layers and so forth. And I can collect all layers into its own group. Uh, it's funny, new group from layers, not a group. Yeah, it's been a while. I use shortcuts to do this. It's very funny. Maybe I don't know how to do it as a... Uh, I do know that if you do uh, command option shift and hit the letter E, you'll gather everything into its own layer, which is what I just did. I'll undo that. So everything that's visible, it's a command option shift, which are your three modifier keys and hit the, uh, hit the letter E, and that puts it all into its own layer. So I just combined all that and kept all the layers. I'm gonna create a new layer, that's layer 11. I'll put it underneath. I'm gonna name it color like this. I'll change layer 10 to art like that. And I'm gonna go under my color layer. I'm gonna pick a green color like this, green. And I'm gonna make my brush larger and I'm gonna start painting, but I don't see anything. And the reason why is because I'm painting underneath this layer. You see, I'm painting green underneath it. I need a way to take the art layer and make it so that the white disappears without erasing it. And that's the properties of something called multiply. Multiply makes the darks black. You can't get anything blacker than darker than black. Black goes black and anything white, you can't make anything whiter than white, goes clear. If there were shades of gray in there, you would see them sort of fading in and fading out. The opposite of multiply is screen. In screen's case, black goes clear and white stays white. So a lot of comic book artists use this. It's one of the reasons I brought it up. I know some of you listening may be doing comics. So once I've got my line art, if I set my line art to multiply, and then what I like to do is lock it. That way I don't accidentally draw on this layer. And now I go down to my color layer and wherever I color is going to see, you're going to see through it like that. So now I could hand color all of that. Now I'm gonna to go to the art layer again and go back to this magic wand because magic wand is just a great way to start selecting areas. If I click out here, I'm clicking on white on the art layer and it's gonna select white until it hits something that isn't white, in this particular case, the black. All right, now I got a kind of a mess in here, but that's all right. Now what's selected? Well, I selected the outside white. So under select, I'm gonna to go to uh, inverse and that's gonna flip it. And now I can take a big brush. There's lots of ways to do this. Go down. You see how I can't draw in this layer? I'm on the art layer and it's got circle. No, I'll go to the color layer, make it really big, and I'll just fill all that in. And that way it keeps me from going around it a lot. And then I'm going to have to deselect and come in and do all of this. I just really quick hand work, things that, that didn't quite work. So hopefully you're understanding I'm, I'm filling a layer underneath. Now I can lock, there's lots of ways, I can lock the transparency of that layer. Now, what does that mean? That means that I can take a dark, I can draw anywhere on this layer, but if I lock the transparency, I can't draw where there's transparency. So with that in mind now, this layer is totally locked. I can't do anything to it, but this layer is only partially locked. I can come along and I can pick a darker color. And again, I don't like just going into black, and I'll pick a grunge brush. Let's see, let's do something really quick. Uh, let's take something like this is a splatter brush and I'll put that in. I'll set it to like number 2% and I'll just start to splatter in some color like that. Maybe that's a little dark, I don't know. Let me go back over top of it with a little bit lighter color. And I just wanna get this like weird texture going here on him. I'll come in close to this so you can sort of see. Now, you know, there's no rules in Photoshop. When I teach Photoshop, I'm, all I'm really teaching students is this is what this tool does. Now, how are you going to be creative with it? And, you know, you see these books on do step one and do step two, and do step three. And, and that's not what Photoshop does. You, you invent your way to work in this program. Uh, I mean, I could smudge that now. I could paint over top of that now. Uh, you're, you're inventing how it is you want to work in the program and what you want it to do. Uh, let me go back to brush and uh, get up to seven. I'm coloring in. I'm, my brush is set to multiply. It wasn't, wasn't working. There we go. 
and I'll put in some yellow teeth like this, and then I'll flip this and then I'll put in some eye whites really quick, like here and here, maybe you needed red eye, I don't know. Uh, and so you just continue to work the piece. Uh, I put in some highlights on the teeth. Uh, I can hold down my option alt key again, get my eyedropper tool, pick this color, bring it into the warmth, make it a little lighter. And then I can start putting in, maybe bring this up to five, start bringing up some highlights on the, on the skin. If I want it to go faster, I'll go to something like seven and you slowly just build it up. Uh, I don't like this white background, so I'm going to pick white and I'll double click. I'll get like a dark, dark blue. And I'm just going to fill that really quickly and then back to my color layer and away we go back to paintbrush and I'm still working now, putting in some blue colors. So hopefully, how are we doing? We just um, got a few minutes. Just a we few got minutes about five left. minutes left. And uh, there is a question from Rob again. Uh, yeah. He just wants to know if we'd be able to share this with his students. Um, which, yeah, the video oh, should absolutely. the video yeah. should still be saved to the Long Island Tabletop feed. So after this uh, this is over, the, you should be able to access it at any time. And, yeah. I'd ask Rob why would he want to. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> uh, I'm under pressure, here, man. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. Uh, they'll be saved to YouTube, like John said. So the Long Island Tabletop, you're welcome uh, to, to show that to your students. Uh, and uh, so hopefully I've given you a good example rather quickly here. I know I got a little technical on a bunch of stuff, but uh, for those of you who know Photoshop a little bit, you picked up some extra pointers maybe. Uh, I'm just enjoying this guy. I may work on him after I'm done here uh, like that. All right. So uh, look, in closing, I, I can tell you, uh, you know, I've always said, follow your muse. Uh, if you like drawing monsters and stuff, try to stick with it. I, I went to school and got a degree and, and went out into advertising, worked advertising for a long time just to make money and get established. But then on weekends and nights, I started freelancing for a lot of gaming companies, uh, TSR, GDW, uh, to name a few. Um, and it got to the point where I was getting so much work that I could uh, quit my day job. And that was about 35 years ago. So I've been um, an independent contractor, a freelancer, a gig employee, whatever you want to call a self unemployed uh, for about 35 years. Uh, and it's been a richly rewarding career. Uh, I love to draw monsters in science fiction. Uh, it's not all that I draw, though. Uh, I do do a lot of advertising work, and I've done a lot of uh, different paintings and uh, designs for a wide variety of clients. Um, to me, you know, it's a way to make a living, but it's also doing something that I really enjoy doing. Uh, and I do like to get back into doing uh, uh, science fiction uh, as much as possible. Uh, see if I had another piece or two here to share with you, uh, painting examples. Uh, no, I'll tap. I, th I think I posted this one on the Discord server, uh, which is a piece that I've shown quite a bit. This is called Father Time. Uh, whoa, it took off. There we go, like that. Uh, and so, you know, this is a painting, this is a horror painting, but it's also a painting of hope because in this particular case, uh, Father Time is putting the period in the book of your life. And, uh, you know, the guy behind him was looking at you for the first and last time. So there's a lot of homages there from light to dark to the clocks, uh, everything going on. Why do I call it hope? Is because you got to remember that we don't get out of this alive. So do what you'd like to do in your life. Uh, there are jobs out there creating content for uh, television, motion picture, webtoons. Uh, you could start your own web too now if you're a young person listening in. Just follow your muse and be creative. A creative life is uh, an amazing thing. If you took my creativity away, well, I might as well meet Father Time here. Uh, you just, just, you know, why? The non-creative life, uh, it would be a terrible thing for me. Uh, another thing I tell students is there's two types of people in the world, those who consume and those who create. I'd much rather be the, the creator. 
Uh, even though I like to watch like Marvel movies, I'm consuming what other people have created. Uh, I still like to sit down and, and create my own stuff. Uh, that who knows, maybe you could turn into a product, a T-shirt, uh, or maybe an animated series, or who knows where that might lead you. Um, I grew up in Kentucky. You probably recognize this accent of mine. Uh, and I got out of Kentucky really fast when I graduated. But from a, a poor little boy from Kentucky to have gone places with my art that I've gone to uh, still amazes me and it humbles me. So I encourage each and every one of you out there to follow your muse, uh, do your best work, be creative, and enjoy what you're doing. All right, Dave, yep, I think that's perfect. Um, again, thank you everyone so much for joining us for this stream. Uh, you'll be able to see it on the Long Island Tabletop YouTube channel. Um, and also, the, feel free to join us tonight at 8 o'clock when Dave is going to be running, uh, well, actually, why don't you do the, uh, oh. do, why don't you do the honors? Oh, now, one of the things I did not mention is I'm a gamer at heart. So we are running Scooby-Doo meets Cthulhu. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, of a forerunner on that. Let me go into my full screen here and fit to window. So it's Scooby-Doo, Where Are You, the Cthulhu edition. And one of the fun things you can do in Photoshop is stuff like this. Here we go. Oh, no, 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 no. Look at <laughs> So uh, everybody's going to take a character, including uh, Scooby. And uh, we're investigating a haunted house this evening. So uh, it's filled up, John. I know the game. There's no slots mm -hmm. left for it. But definitely tune in and chat with us as we play. All right. Sounds good. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, continue to get your game on, and we will all catch you next time. All right. Thanks.